on a mission here to start on the very power of God in creation. That was where I started. And then we took two services and we were talking about the power of God over mankind. And then last we preached on the power of God through his word. And today I want to preach on the power of God in regeneration. And uh, I'm tempted if, if the Lord leads me to uh, preach another message on how the Lord is able to empower us to be able to live a godly life. That is, that's another possibility. But if you stand for the reading of God's word, we'll be in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and uh, starting in verse 11. Amen. Amen. Second Corinthians chapter 5, starting in verse 11. Amen. Is everybody standing unless there's something wrong with you that you physically can't stand? We read for the standing of God's word in, in reverence to his word. Second Corinthians chapter 5, starting in verse 11. It says, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your conscience. For we command not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that you may have somewhat to answer them which glory in appearance and not in heart. For whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God, or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. For the love of Christ constrains us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which should li that live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth we know no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away, behold, all things become new. All things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself, by Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. You may be seated. Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you for your word. Infallible as it is, and as glorious as it is, Lord, we ask you today that your name would have free course, be glorified. Lord, I come to you today, Lord God, with no delusion in my ability to preach your word. Lord, this is what you have given me, and I pray that you give me the words to say. I can't say them. And I pray, Holy Spirit of God, you would flow up and down the pews of this church. I pray that you'd have your way with every soul that is here. And I pray that your name would have free course, be lifted up and be glorified. And it's in your holy name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Whether we know it or not, you're living in two different realms today. You're living in a physical realm, which you see all around you here in this room, a physical life, which you can eat, breathe, eat, you know, drink, and walk. That's a physical realm in which you know. But there's another realm in which you can't see. And it's another realm that decides how your physical realm is going to work out. And that is the spiritual realm. And when you understand the spiritual realm, you understand why your physical realm works the way it does. Because the spiritual will add to how your physical life is going to be. And so you walk around and you, you're able to do the things that you are doing. But yet there's another realm in which all things are before your physical. And I want to be able to point that out to you because many people don't understand that there are two different realms that you're living in. One that you can see and one that is invisible to you. And if you were able to see the physical realm right now, you would see that the Lord Jesus Christ in all of heaven has his dominion 
over the, all of that we see, there are angels, there are angelic beings that we can't see that are for us, but then Satan has his own minions or has his own army that are at war with heaven. And if you could see that in this place today, you would see that there's a war going on between my ability to be able to preach the word to you and you to be able to receive what I'm saying. There's a spiritual aspect to all of that. And so when I come into this place, and when I come to be able to present the word of God, I'm just a vessel the Lord has chosen. That's all I am, really. I mean, I love to preach, I love to come down here, but the Lord has given me the heart to want to come. And the Lord has given me the desire to be here. It is not something that I naturally have. It didn't come to me. But when I gave myself to the Lord, the Holy Spirit gave me that burden upon my heart. It gave me that love for you guys to come down here. And I honestly love to come down here. And I, I honestly love to share. And uh, I consider it a privilege and honor to present the word of God to you, to be a part of uh, the Milwaukee Rescue Mission services, to, to be able to volunteer to preach. And... Uh, I hope that never changes until the day I'm raptured out of here or taken home some other way. I don't mind if I'm 100 years old. If I can make it up to this podium here, I'm hoping for it. But there's, that's what I want to do. But when I come here, I'm relying on the Holy Spirit of God to present to you something in the spiritual which you and I, without Him, would not be able to be able to see. <laughs> You see, the spiritual realm tells us that we are blind to the spiritual things of this world. We don't understand them. And we don't know what they are. But when we look through them through the lens of the Holy Spirit, then we see that another world that we weren't normally able to see. And you see, some people come to a decision for Christ. And they say, well, uh, when I found Jesus, or when I found God, well, first of all, you weren't looking for him, and second of all, God wasn't lost. You see, the Holy Spirit has to come to you to convict you and I that we're in blindness, that we are unregenerated, that we're unsaved, that we don't know Jesus Christ. He has to come to us to show us our lost state, to show us that if we don't give our life to the Lord, that if we don't turn from our sin, if we don't from our ways, that there's an eternal separation. But unless the Holy Spirit shows us that, we will continue to walk in blindness, we'll continue to walk in darkness, and we'll never know we're lost. We'll never know. And you'll never know you're lost until somebody tells you that you're lost. And the Holy Spirit comes and he comes into the service and he tries to convict hearts and he tries to awaken hearts to the state of the spiritual realm that you're lost. That, that unless you turn to Christ that there's an, an eternal separation. And that's the Holy Spirit's job. He comes to convict and he comes to show men that they're lost. And he comes to show them and he opens their eyes and in an awakening shows them that for the first time you, you may say, I, I, I'm really lost. I, I really need Jesus. I, and if I don't get him, I, I know that something is not going to be right. I know I'm not going to merit heaven. And there are people who come into this world. There's people who live this whole world who think that somehow by their own merits, by their own works, that somehow they're going to obtain the grace and mercy of God to be able to make it into heaven. But unless the Holy Spirit draws you, unless the Holy Spirit shows you that, you're never going to come. You're never going to make that decision. Because you can't make that decision without the Holy Spirit leading you. You can't make that decision by yourself without the Holy Spirit showing you your lost state and giving you the ability to see that. And so the Holy Spirit has the job of awakening you to the, to the position of where you are spiritually. And, and some people 
they, they come to a hard time in the physical realm. They lose their job, they lose their house, they lose their car, they lose their wife, they lose their kids. Everything seems to be going downhill in the physical. Well, that is because there's something in the spiritual that's going on that caused that physical realm to go where it was. And sometimes people have to hit the bottom in order for them to cry out to God to say, I'm lost, I really need you, God. And human nature is such, I was talking with a person last night, if you think you could make a way out of your situation without turning to Christ, you will do it every time. It's human nature. But it's only when you come to the realization, when you're at the end of all things, and you look up and you say, you know what? I can't do it. There's, I, I've tried everything. It's not going to work. Finally, you surrender and you turn your life to the Lord. But until that time, you're going to try and you're going to try and you're going to try. Every angle there is to be able to somehow make it work for yourself. And so in the physical realm, we try to fill these voids in our hearts with all sorts of things like material wealth and, and money and prosperity to try to make somehow a joy and a happiness and a peace. And if I just have this example, if I just have that example, if I just have this, that, and the other, I'm going to be happy, I'm going to have peace, I'm going to have joy. But yet I find so many people that I have known in my own life, millionaires, and one man in particular, a billionaire of a company that's known in Wisconsin, who died into, dived into his water in, in the, in the uh, place where he lived, not too far from here, jumped into the lake, he drowned and there was a bunch of pills found on the deck, a multi-billionaire of many of the companies around, of a major company around here died. He couldn't find happiness in all of what she had. And it's, it happens all the time. Money, prosperity, material wealth cannot fill the void in the physical. But in the spiritual, it is the Lord Jesus Christ who can fill that heart, who can fill that void. And it's only when Christ comes into your life, it is only when the Holy Spirit comes to resonate in your life that you're no longer an enemy of God, which is the void problem. And it's, you're at peace with God because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. And the Holy Spirit comes to live within you. And when that happens, there's a void that's filled. And, it, and, and it's free. You know, people try to cram all these different things into their life to, to fill a void that you can fill for free. And that void is played out in the physical but it started out in the spiritual. When Christ comes into your life, he changes you. The Bible says in verse 17, it says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. And the reason for that is that God no longer looks at you the same way. When you come to a saving relationship with Jesus, you're no longer that enemy of God. And, the, and the, the way that you know that is because you have a void that's in your heart that tells you, I no longer have to fill this void. I have a peace. I have a happiness. And you can have absolutely nothing. You can be dead broke. And you can have peace and joy and happiness in your heart because you're no longer an enemy of God. And your situation has changed. You're no longer an enemy of God. But now you become an heir to the kingdom of God. Now you become a saint. Now your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. You have eternal life. And you're going somewhere. And the peace of God rests upon you. Then it doesn't matter when you die. And it doesn't matter if you die. Because you know where you're going to spend eternity. That is settled in heaven forever. And it is settled in your heart forever. You and I don't have to worry about what happens to this body because we know we are no longer ourselves, but we are the heir to the kingdom of God. Children of the very God himself. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. Well, let me start, go up a little higher than that because I, I wanted to capture part of... Uh, Part of what uh, they are saying here, starting at verse 13. 
our verse 12, seeing then that we have such great hope, we have great plainness of speech, and not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished, but their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even out to this day, when Moses read the veil upon their hearts, nevertheless, when it shall, it shall turn to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with open face holding, beholding, as in a glass, the glory of God, and changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. It is through that work of the Holy Spirit that comes into our lives, that takes the veil, the blindest veil off of our eyes, that now we can behold and we can see that we were lost. We can see now that we are somebody that we were not. And when the Holy Spirit comes and regenerates you, which brings you back into a spiritual life, you have a spirit, you have a physical life, but when the regeneration happens in your life, the spiritual in which you also live in that was dead is now alive. And when that spiritual comes alive, you're able to understand the Word of God. You understand of that the fact that I was lost. You understand that all of a sudden now I am a child of the King. You understand that there's something special about your life. And when you get going for the Lord and you allow Him to work in your life and you allow Him to have full reign over you, He can make you into the man that He's called you to make you into. But in the Holy Spirit's job is to make you that when He comes to enter into your heart. But you and I have to come to the decision when we're pressed by the Holy Spirit, yes, Lord, I want you. Yes, Lord, I want to make a decision because the Holy Spirit of God is a gentleman. He'll press on your door and he'll say, you're lost, you're lost, you're lost. But he's not going to continue to pry on you. After a period of time, he'll walk away as a gentleman would and say, well, I tried. And who knows? Who knows? But the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Why is there liberty in that spirit of the Lord? Because in the spiritual, we were blind. In the spiritual, we were in prison. In the spiritual, we were in chains. In the spiritual, we were in bondage. In the spiritual, we don't know who we are. In the spiritual, we can't see our lost state. In the spiritual, we don't understand who God is. It, without the Him and that, without the Holy Spirit, we don't even know we're enemies of God. Without the Holy Spirit, we continue to think that if we just do 51% good, 49% bad, hey, I'm in heaven. But the Holy Spirit comes to convict and he comes to show us our lost state. But he brings liberty because he takes all those things of bondage out of our hearts. He takes all those things of bondage out of our body. And, and you may come into this place today, you may be weak, you may be weary. And you may be saying in the spiritual, I understand, I'm weak, I'm weary, I'm, in, I'm blind, I can't see that I'm lost, I can't see my understanding, I, I don't know what this preacher is saying, I don't know what the word of God is saying, I, I don't know what my fellow brothers and sisters are trying to say to me, but I've come to the understanding that the Holy Spirit of God can come into your heart and show you your lost state, can shine a light in the dark crevices of your heart and show you your lost state and bring a peace, a joy in your heart that passes all understanding. Even in the midst of your trial, even in the midst of your difficult situations, even in times when it makes no sense at all for people to look at you and go, why is that person happy? Because I know the Lord is in me. I know the Lord is going to do something. And if I just hold on to Him, if I just say, Holy Spirit of God, just have your way with me. I know he's going to make me to the man of God he's called me to be. But self-generation is impossible. 
Romans 8, 5 through 9 says, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is an enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. So when they that are in the flesh cannot please God, but ye are not in the flesh, but are of the Spirit, if so be that the Son of God, the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And so without the Holy Spirit in your life, without him doing a work in your life, all you have is this flesh that you live in. All you have is the physical without an awakened physical without an awakened spiritual. But there are some who can, in their mind and in their heart and in who they are, can mimic the working of the Holy Spirit in their life and they can, they can have all the outside, outward looks of someone who's saved and someone who gave their life to the Lord and know who Jesus Christ is and, and know Him as Lord and Savior. You can mentally do that and have that head knowledge. But that head knowledge needs to go the 14 or 12 inches to your heart. And the only way the knowledge can work from your head to your heart is if the Holy Spirit draws it, and if the Holy Spirit gives it to you, and if the Holy Spirit reigns within you to be able to show you that. Then you have something. Because without the Holy Spirit showing you your lost state, all you have is a mental knowledge of who you are. Jesus, in John 3.3, 3, came across uh, a man that was a leader, a religious leader. And this religious, religious leader came to him and wanted to know about this power that Christ had. And he wanted to know about what it was about this, this Jesus. And the Lord said to him, he said in John 3, 3, when Nicodemus came to him, Jesus said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That's the words of Jesus. Now that word born again means to be born from above, from a higher place, of things that come from heaven or God. But it is the power that comes from heaven. It is the power that comes from the Lord to be able to change the life of who we are. And when that Holy Spirit comes within us, they completely change you if you allow him from the person that you were into the person that he wants you to become. And I've known men that came to the Lord in this place over the years that I preached. Men that I still see once in a while that have this Lord in them and they're completely different now than they were when they came up to me and received the Lord. And, and I, don't, I, don't, I don't save anybody. I, I, I need somebody to sit his prayer. I, I'm led by the Lord to do what I do. But the Lord does the saving. I leave the results up to him. I preach what he tells me to preach, and the rest is up to him if anybody's going to get saved. But when they do, and they make that decision, their lives are utterly changed from the inside out. Because the Holy Spirit, once he, once he takes residence within that heart, he doesn't keep you that way, but he works. And his job, in the working of you, changes you from the inside out. But the Holy Spirit is the power of regeneration. To spiritually take a dead man who's spiritually dead, to take a man who spiritually is blind and cannot even see that he is lost. And, and it takes a, a, a man that cannot even understand the word of God or, or even that in fact he's an enemy of God. It is the Holy Spirit that comes into your life and shows you that. It shows you who you really are in the spiritual. And like John Newton, who we just sang about in his song, was that slave trader. And he was a slave trader, and he came to the end of himself, and he cried out for God to help him. And the Lord saved him, as we call it. He became born again. 
And it, it was after that that he worked along with other men to be able to abolish slave trading. But his heart, his heart changed. There was a complete change of who he was according to 2 Corinthians 5.17 that we read. Because when God enters your heart, when God enters you, there are two things that are going to happen to you and I. Either we are going to resist the Lord, resist what he has for us, resist his teaching, resist the fact that he wants us to come to him, or we're going to embrace what he's saying, embrace the fact that we're lost, and we're going to cry out and we're going to receive him as Lord and Savior. We're only two directions, but you're going to go one way or the other because the conviction of the Lord is going to be upon you. I heard a story over the past week over a man who was in a southern prison, and he, I don't remember what he was in prison for, but I know it's a true story. I couldn't get his name before I got here. But he was in prison, and he was a terrible man. He was a wicked man. I mean, the people that were in his own cell couldn't stand him. And he was a, a terrible blasphemer. He was a mean, artery man. And he hated the world. He hated everything. And, and it, it's bad when your own prisoners, your own cell can't even stand to be with you. And, and so they couldn't stand to be with him so bad because he was so terrible to them and, and to, to everybody else that they put him in solitary confinement because they, they, wanted to, they didn't want the other people to get hurt anymore. But he was mean, he was violent, he was crude, he was vile. He spewed out wickedness like there was no day tomorrow. He was a terrible, terrible man. But he was in solitary confinement. One of the guards gave him a Bible. And he was ready to chew up all the pages of the Bible and just spit it back at this guard. But he decided to sit down and he decided to read it. And as he decided to read it, the Word of God spoke to him. And the Holy Spirit started working and convicting him. And I don't remember the length of time it was. But there came a time when his heart melted. And all the wickedness, all of the vileness in this man's life melted away. Melted away and he became saved. And he became one of the greatest men to witness in prison for the Lord Jesus Christ. And the staff noticed that there was a direct change after he received the word of God and after he started reading it. Because the Holy Spirit took a man that was cruel, vile, wicked on every point, every point possible. A man that was so low in the mire, a man that was so low in the totem pole, a man that was so low in the scheme of men in life that even men didn't want to be with them. He was so low that there was nobody that wanted to have anything to do with them. But the Holy Spirit of God the all-powerful, almighty Holy Spirit of God, the third person of the Trinity, came into his life and continued to soften his heart and continued to make him and mold him. And eventually he cried out and he received Christ. And I say, if you look at this man's life, and there's a million stories like this man all the time. Have you ever listened on Shackled? on the radio, you, you, there's, this happens all the time. But there's no one in this room who's beneath the power of the Holy Spirit in regeneration. There's no one in this room who has stooped so low that the Holy Spirit can't grab them and save them from the miry clay. There's no one in this room that has done so much evil, that has done so much terror, has done so much bad, that the Holy Spirit of God cannot change their lives. The power of God rests in the very fact that in the verse that verses that we just read in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, that God is not a respecter of people. We all have the veil over our eyes. And it is the Holy Spirit of God who takes the veil off of our eyes, shows us our lost state, shows us that we're in need of a Savior. It is the Holy Spirit of God through His power through the power that rests within the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost that shines down upon us 
and regenerates us. No man, no woman, no child is going to be in heaven because they did it themselves. Everyone is going, to, that is going to be in heaven is going to be in heaven because the same Holy Spirit awakened them, showed them their lost state, and saved them. The same Holy Spirit will do all the work. And it's that same Holy Spirit, as John Newton said, will take them home. It is the same God that sent his only begotten Son to come down to this world to die for the sins of mankind, to take our place on the cross. And when God looks upon us, he doesn't look upon us as sinners, but he looks upon us with the righteousness of Christ. He looks upon us with the blood of Christ that cleanses us, shining upon us. When he looks at us, he sees Christ. When he looks at us, he sees his son. And when the devil comes to be able to present to God the Father the fact that you and I should not be in heaven because of what we did, because of our evilness, because of our sinful nature, because of the sins that we committed, Jesus, all he has to do is say, that child is mine. That child is mine. That child is mine because they've accepted the free gift of my salvation. My blood cleansed their sins. My blood has made them whole. And hallelujah, we're on our way to heaven. But it's not by anything that we did. But where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And if you allow the Holy Spirit of God to come down and to flow through the pews and to be able to speak to your heart today, He can change you. He can mold you. He can make you to the man that God wants you to be. He could save your soul. He could save your soul. I don't care who you are. He could save your soul. I, I want to pray for you right now. I want to pray for you right now, but I want to ask a question as we bow our heads, all eyes closed. Will you close your eyes tonight? Where will you awake? Will you awake here on heaven? Will you awake in heaven? Will it be on earth? Or will it be somewhere else? Or will it be the fiery flames of hell? We all have to make a decision. But while there is still breath in your lungs and there's still breath in my lungs, we need to make that decision now. We need to ask God, God, what would you have me to do? I, I'm, in a, I'm in a state where I, I'm in total depravity. I, I can't get saved by myself. I can't come to the Lord. I, I can't make a decision without the Holy Spirit convicting me. But I want to know Jesus. And today I want to pray for you. And if you want to come up and just pray uh, after the service, I am more than willing to stand here until every man is prayed for to pray for you. But I want to pray this simple prayer. But first I want to ask, is there anyone today with all heads bowed, eyes closed, you want to raise a hand and say today, today I want to be snatched from the fire. Today I want to be snatched fiery flames and I want to know Christ I want to know the power of the Holy Spirit I want him to resurrect me I want him to regenerate my spiritual life that I may know this Christ is there anyone that want to raise a hand and say I want to know this Jesus I want to know this Christ yes. let's pray for you and pray for the meal tell me if you just say a simple prayer like this and it comes from the depth of your heart the Lord says that he will come into your life Holy Spirit will come in and live with you. Holy Father, knowing that I'm a sinner and that you died for sinners, I now freely receive you as Lord and Savior of my life. I know I can't save myself, but I know that the Holy Spirit can come into my heart and convict me. I know, Lord Jesus, that you died 
but that you rose again. And I believe with the faith of heaven that you now receive me as a child of God and that my name is written into the Lamb's Book of Life. Congratulations, you now have now entered the eternal life with the Lord and will spend eternity with Him forever and ever. And all of heaven rejoices over the saving of one soul, let alone all the hands that raised a hand today. And Lord, we thank you for the meal that these men are about to receive. We pray that you'd bless the cooks, that you'd bless those that prepared it. Bless Heavenly Father those that have given to the time and the talents and money to be able to make it all work. Take any sickness that may be from among them. And Lord, we just pray that your day would have free course. We glorify every man's life here. We pray today in your holy name.